Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing very well today for something different but very interesting. From Ethan um, today, hey Cap, I think you should make a navigation tutorial for Warbird. This is due to the community growing in World War II and DCS. As you have said, you want to keep people into DCS. I know a lot of people who have left due to not being able to navigate. This wouldn't be a problem, but there are very few navigation tutorials because it's so bloody hard. And the ones there are, they are utter garbage. Cap, regarding Warbird's navigation, aside from compass and map, you can also make use of a kneeboard map and mark your position on the kneeboard using right control K when it's open. To open, you use right shift and K and view the kneeboard map at a glance. You can just hold K. Making your position on the kneeboard map is permanent and points in the direction you're going towards. Also helps if this is preset it by Mission Maker for correct kneeboard to use. Right, that's a lot to think about. So, realistic navigation in World War II aircraft. Up until 1986, I think it was, or all the widespread use of GPS, navigation was a huge and complex issue. Now, we're just looking at World War II warbirds as specified by the valued viewer here. In World War II, there were several different methods of navigation for instance they use radio homing which is not too dissimilar from something like a TACAN or a VOR we could home in on a beacon at an airfield this is modeled in DCS that however would only be of use for getting you back home to do a mission is more complex they also used radio to get the aircraft to a target so in for instance you could have a Loran type of system where you fired radio beams that would intersect over a target and then the bombers would follow one of those beams and when it intersected with another radio beam they would know that they were over the target and then they could drop their bombs and that could be done at night obviously another method is by gci so a ground coordinated interceptor from a ground base could verbally radio to different aircraft to tell them to head on a certain heading or course and fly at a certain speed for a certain amount of time to intercept for instance hostile bombers another method is by simply using the terrain following a river following landmarks and another method is compass plus stopwatch plus map plus calculator or you could have a combination of all four of those and possibly even others that i'm not aware about in one flight making one video that covers all or most of these systems is going to be too big so let's keep it simple let's look at the basic compass map stopwatch and calculator system to show this off we're going to make things simple in real life you would probably have various waypoints you may have to fly from base to waypoint one to waypoint two to waypoint three but to make it very simple we're just going to take off from base we're going to get to waypoint one and waypoint one is going to be our target note that there are no landmarks because we're just going to be flying in the sea so we're going to have to do it all compass stopwatch map and calculator Note that if you use the method we're about to look at for a more complex flight where you have multiple waypoints, for instance, that you have to go between, then it gets much more complicated because you start to increase the amount of error and you have to recalculate or compensate for error. Errors are, for instance, well, there will be a small error in the mission we're doing. For instance, if we start the stopwatch and then we take off and get to a certain speed, well, the time that we were going from standstill to the certain speed is an error because that won't be calculated for, because we'll just be assuming constant speed from Manston to the target. Also, as you change direction at a waypoint, an aircraft doesn't just turn perfectly geometrically, it loses speed, or it gains speed, or it has to go around a curve. These are all things that would have to be compensated for in a complex flight. We're just going to do a simple point A to point B, and we're not going to compensate for the error at the beginning. Let's talk about our mission. Our mission is just a silly fake mission, but it shows it off. We've got to take off from Manston. We've got to fly blind, i.e. we can't use any markers and we're not allowed to even really look for the target and find these uh, baddie ships that have been uh, reported. We know, and here's where it starts getting complex already, from Manston to where the target is, is a true, not a magnetic, a true bearing of 118 degrees and a distance of 
Naon 22 nautical miles, not miles, but nautical miles. There will be translations between nautical miles and miles throughout this calculation. Now, to make it more realistic, you're almost certainly going to have a wind. The wind in our DCS mission is going to be traveling in the direction of, as set in the mission editor of DCS, 143 degrees true. So if I kind of draw a line, something like that would be 143 degrees true. And that is going to push us off course to the right. And we're going to have to use our calculator to compensate for that. Again, in real life, you may have changes in wind in different locations. Again, that's too complicated for us today. Let's just keep it simple and say there's one uniform wind from point A, or the start of the mission, to the end of the mission. Before we do anything, we need to find the difference between the true heading, i.e. the one that's going to point to the North Pole from our position, which is specific to A, this part of the world, and B, this year to the magnetic heading so this will be called magnetic variation or magnetic declination the difference between true and magnetic so let's go to our first sheet of the day which is going to be our declination calculator historical declination viewer so i will link this in the video description you have to do this otherwise nothing will work in dcs and this is modeled accurately in dcs another thing i should say, say is that in a dcs mission we've set the year to be 1942 if you set it to 1995, the magnetic declination will be completely different. So this has to be taken into account. So let's set the date to 1942, or as close as we can get. I've got it bang on, 1942. This is showing the man magnetic field lines of the Earth. They constantly change over the years. Do not underestimate them. There's Blighty. Got to find the nearest field line, which is going to be, mm, I think, probably that one there. Where Manson's what, there? Our target's there. Let's just have a click on that. Okay, declination of highlighted line, 9 degrees west, west of north. 9 degrees west of north. So, we're done in this sheet now. Let's go to our next sheet. This is an E6B calculator. An E6B was a very simple manual computer available in World War II, and I'm sure they had different types and probably more modern ones by then, that allow you to make calculations for a flight like this. In fact, let's just go and get a picture of one, shall we? e 6 be. I'm sure you guys know a lot more about this than me, but there, real basic manual calculator slash computer. So in our emulator here, we're going to type in. We know the course and we're just going to stick to true at this point. The version between true and magnetic we will implement later on in the mission. You don't have to do it like that, but that's just how we're going to do it because we think it's the simplest way to display it. So the true course from Manston to the target was 118 degrees. Next, we need to type in our true airspeed in knots or miles an hour. What you put in here is what you get out. Miles an hour mix with standard miles. Knots mix with nautical miles. Before you even type this in, you have to understand what true airspeed is. There are several types of airspeed. Indicated airspeed, calibrated airspeed, equivalent airspeed, true airspeed, and ground speed. They all mean different things, and you have to understand them. So a true airspeed, for sake of argument, and just again to keep this simple, is going to be more or less the same as indicated airspeed at low level, ground level. So as long as we fly low, just to keep this simple, our true airspeed is going to pretty much match our indicated airspeed. If you're a bomber flying at 20,000 feet, you would have to do calculations to convert between pressure airspeed, your pitot airspeed, and your true airspeed. So just bear that in mind. And if you want to know how to do that, by the way, we've got a video and you can search Grim Reaper's true airspeed. So our true airspeed, we've decided, is going to be, well, we're going to be using a P-47 today, which is in miles per hour. It's an old units. So we're going to need to convert. So why don't we say uh, we are going to fly at 200 miles an hour, just to make it nice and round so that's gonna give us 174 knots 174 knots to airspeed wind direction now remember this is proper wind direction so we need to put in the reciprocal of the wind direction of dcs well the reciprocal of 143 which is in dcs is going to be 323 there so you can see the wind coming from the bearing of 323 a wind speed again we're putting in knots nautical miles here can't mix knots and standard miles 20 knots, I think DCS said it was. There's a distance we're traveling of 22 nautical miles. Nautical miles. Okay. We have our final calculation here. The variation between the course line from point A to point B and the heading of our aircraft is going to be 3 degrees. Minus 3 degrees, 3 degrees to the left. So we're going to point our aircraft, our heading, at 115. And that is to compensate for this wind from 323 3 at 20 knots. Our ground speed is going to be 192, and our flight time is going to be 6 minutes and 53 seconds. So all we've got to remember is 200 miles an hour, 
true heading at 115 and 6 minutes and 53 so let's write that down in our flight plan. Hey viewers next we need to set our aircraft correctly first we have to understand our aircraft so this particular aircraft is going to have a non-adjustable magnetic compass there that will always read ma to magnetic north. All of these instruments have advantages and disadvantages so the good thing about it is that it won't slip out of alignment like a, a gyro based system. The bad thing about it is that it is unreliable when in the air. It can be unreliable the actual reading it gives when in the air. You can even see just the vibration of the cockpit bouncing around there. Not a very stable system. So to actually read and work with we've got a gyro compass here. A bit like a very simple INS inertial navigation system in like a mirage or something like that. The advantage is it's stable, it's reliable and easy to use. The bad side of it is that it dealigns itself, it deteriorates itself in quality up to 15 degrees per hour, we've heard, like, for instance, a Mirage INS system. Now, the deterioration in quality of navigation is not going to worry us too much in this mission. We're only going for six or so minutes in that we're going to get very little slippage or error created in this gyro system but in a big mission if you're going to go and fly for an hour or so you've got to realize that this here is going to have to be recalibrated at least once during your flight to keep it calibrated another thing this uh, directional gyro is extremely upsettable delicate maybe is a better word so for instance you'll notice i'm on the runway here ready to take off i would not set this up before taxiing even the taxiing of an aircraft the vibrations will ruin its alignment so make sure it's the very last thing we're going to do before taking off and when we take off nice and straight and slick next maneuvering a directional gyro cannot take harsh maneuvers you will destroy it like with a gyro gun sight like with in some cases an INS system an F-14 a Mirage if you maneuver too hard you will wreck uh, your INS system and it will no longer be reliable. This is all simulated in DCS which is an incredibly fine and detailed simulator so you've really got to know how to fly with that. So now we've understood how our instruments work, what the positives and negatives are, the weaknesses, then we need to set them up. So we can look down here and we can tell ourselves that we are on, well that's 270 magnetic, that's 280, that's 290, so I'm going to say we're 280 nine two eight nine magnetic heading uh feed in our nine degrees west of north magnetic declination minus nine makes it two eight zero right so let's recalibrate our directional gyro as two eight zero now we can see that our directional directional gyro based on our magnetic heading is showing a true heading of 280 that's how we're going to navigate with in this case a directional gyro set to true next we're going to take off we're going to turn around we're going to make things a bit more accurate fly over the runway at our set speed of 200 miles an hour airspeed and we'll be at low level so pretty much the same as true airspeed at a direction gyro gyro compass true heading of 115 We'll start the stopwatch when we hit the runway and then we'll stop the stopwatch at six minutes and 53 seconds right nice clean takeoff now we don't want to upset that gyro compass you can see it wiggling about a bit the gyro compass even though we're not actually changing direction Lovely stable warbird to fly here, so oh. no banging the wheels down. We don't upset that compass. Right, I'm just going to fly in this direction for a little bit. Now, when I turn, I'm not going to do a big pulling bank because if I did that, then I'll have I got my canopy open. I have. How about that? I don't want to do a harsh bank because what a surprise! I'll ruin my directional gyro. So I'm going to do a nice slow teardrop. Also work my way up to 200 miles an hour now and set my trim. There may be a safe limit of bank that you can do to keep the gyro uh, aligned. I don't know what that is, so I'm just going to have a guess of about 20 degrees. Okay, back around to the airfield, up to 200 miles per hour again. Setting course for 115, gone over it slightly. Let's get back there. Okay. 
on gyro heading at 115. Crossing the airfield now, just need to get our speed up again. Just let it slip. 200 miles per hour. Hold the throttle and over the airfield and start the stopwatch. All the things we've got to do and we're back. Right, so now we've got to keep VSI neutral. We've got to keep speed at 200 miles an hour, a little fast there. And we've got to keep the uh, your, we've got to keep the rudder coordinated and we've got to keep on the gyro heading of uh, 115. And all the time we're going to be watching our uh, stopwatch on the other screen, which I will superimpose. VSI centered. Speedo 200 miles an hour IAS and pretty much the same as true. Slightly off 115, so let's compensate there. 45 seconds mark. Just center those instruments there. It's all about precision. The more precise I fly this, the better the results I'm going to have. If I fly poorly, if I fly up and down too much, it will make it inaccurate. If I fly my airspeed, or true speed, to uh, inaccurately, it'll be off. And if I fly, of course, the gyro, it'll be off. And if I do hard manoeuvring or have some vibration, it will also be off. So it's very hard to be on. Okay. We're off again. Back on heading. Speed is good. VSI is good. Slightly off heading again. Time. 1 minute and 30. Got a while to go yet. Yeah. Off heading again. We've compensated. Too slow. VSI neutralise. On heading. Too slow. Power up. Keep diving. So I can need to retrim here. Too slow, and we're off heading. On heading. VSI neutralise. Ah, we're doing pretty well there. We're a little slow for a little. That's two miles now, too slow for quite a bit. Pump, pump the power up a bit, neutralise the VSI. Okay, speed's good, heading's good, and VSI's good. We've finally got it all caught fast. Heading's good. Too fast. Off the power. Neutralise the VSI. Time check. 2 minutes and 40 seconds. And off heading. Speed's good. VSI's good. On heading. Speed's good, VSI's good. Neutralise the VSI. Off heading. Time check. 3 minutes and 15. Off heading. Too slow. On heading. Too slow. On the power. Neutralise the VSI. And we're bang on. Right, hold that. Easier said than done. In autopilot. Neutralise the VSI and we're off heading. On heading. Speed is perfect. I think we've finally got the speed sorted. So it's now just really trying to keep that heading. Slip too far the other way. Speed's good. Heading's good. VSI is good. Got it nice there. I've got it nice right there, look. Got it perfect. Speed check. Four minutes and thirty-three. 
Bang on heading, bang on speed, bang on VSI. Rudder is coordinated. Off heading. Too fast. As we go and burn more fuel up, we'll have to make uh, various adjustments. Uh, off heading. Off heading. Getting in a bit of a fishtail now. Check the time. Five minutes and. Whoops. Five minutes and 20 seconds. Okay, off heading, speed's good, VSI is good. Off heading. Time check, five minutes and 44, one minute to go. Off heading. On heading on speed on VSI. And that's not a spaking, we are getting shot at. I forgot to tell them to help fire, so fingers crossed. Six minutes, 53 seconds to go. Knowing my luck, I'm about to get blasted out of the sky here. <laughs> yes, I am, aren't I? 20 seconds, to, 30 seconds to go. On speed, pretty much from VSI, on heading. 20 seconds to go. On speed, on heading, on VSI. 10 seconds to go. Three, two, one, stop. Right, well, that's where it got me, <laughs> which is not too bad, actually. From there to there. But, uh, so that was where we were supposed to go. Uh, so we had a azimuth deviation of about 0 0.9 nautical miles, which is a bit harsher than I was hoping for. If you could do a bit of tr trigonometry, you could work out how many degrees I'm off. I'm going to have a guess about one degree off to the left. I, I've done something slightly wrong. I've probably flown it about one degree wrong. Obviously, flying fractions of a degree, you know, rounded up to a degree, is a difficult thing to do. So with my skill level, that's about as accurate as I can fly in azimuth. We were short, unfortunately, by 1. Uh, I don't know, 1.5 miles. Let's round up between friends. A bit disappointed by that because I really thought I got the uh, speed bang on there. So let me just go and check everything and make sure I haven't uh, screwed the pooch somewhere. And, uh, so ba -ba 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 -ba. Uh, ah, that's the problem. Yeah, I forgot. Um, I set the uh, wind not at 20 knots, actually down low at 10 knots. Because if you set it there at 20, it goes 10 there. If you set it at 20, it goes 10 there for some reason. So that's probably why. So we can quickly can make a calculation off screen here uh, just to uh, check. So 10 knots, that's what, 12 miles an hour. 12 miles an hour over 6 minutes and 57. Let's just say 7 minutes. So let's do 7 minutes divided by 60 equals 0 0.11666 times 12 miles an hour equals 1.4 miles. So because there should have been an extra 10 or I, I thought there should have been an extra 10 knots pushing me uh, kind of that way, I was slightly shy and it works out exactly uh, 1.4 miles is what I was sure bush shy by so if I had correctly put that to 20 knots there I would have been literally exactly over them in terms of length so the length was perfect pretty much it's just the azimuth I got wrong so that's showing how that system works what we'll do next is we're going to a more advanced tutorial where you have to do several waypoints so to waypoint there to waypoint there to waypoint there to waypoint there and we have a technique at that point to place each waypoint at a visual inspection point like a small island or a port or a town center or something that you can visually and when that happens then you can essentially recenter the nav system to that point so any error that you've got so far like you can see i had a mile error and a mile and a half uh, kind of longitude you can reset it eliminate any error so the next leg will be error free and then when you get to that next point there a visual point then you can again eliminate error and reset your system there and then 
reset your system the next one so that by the time you get to the tar target and you've flown all of the waypoints you've only got almost no error like a miles error or something like that there's different ways we can do that anyway i hope i showed you enough to get started and that was useful and see you later